This is the latest complete TOEFL test from TST Prep. This is test number 11. So this is a brand new and updated test. So if you haven't heard, on July 26, 2023, the TOEFL test changed, and this is the updated version of the test. If you watched recently, you've seen me upload videos for reading, listening, speaking, and writing. So I've taken all of those sections and put them together in this one video so you have a complete test experience. Uh, you can download a link in the, in the description for a PDF with answer explanations to all of the sections, but that's it. Good luck, everybody, and I'll see you at the end. A couple of small differences between this test and what you'll see on test day in terms of format. So on test day, the reading passage will be on the right and the listening and the question, excuse me, will be on the left. But here we have the paragraph and question together just so the text is big and you can see it. The other thing to keep in mind is that on test day, you're in control of your time. And what that means is that if you want to answer a question in 10 seconds or you want to qu answer a question in three minutes, you probably don't want to do that. But if you want to take that much time, you can. But for this test, we give a set amount of time for each question. Two more very important things. The first is that in the description, you will see a download for the PDF that explains all the answers. You'll see the answers in the description but you can also download the PDF with answer explanations. I know I'm gonna get comments, where are the answers? Again, they're in the PDF in the description. The second important thing I wanted to share is this grading chart. So there are 20 questions, there are two summary questions, and there were two points. So the highest score you can get is 22. So this is a conversion chart. So you can see what your score is and what your score would be in the reading section. If you remember, the highest score you can get in the reading is 30. So check that chart out if you want to check your score. Now, if you want to get your test score as quickly and as easily as possible, I recommend the TOEFL Emergency Premium Package. This includes study plans for two days, one week, two weeks, and one month. So this is perfect for anybody with one month or less to prepare and just want to have everything laid out so you know exactly what to do every day. And this offers only for the YouTube audience. So make sure to check out the link in the description for that exclusive discount if you don't want to waste any time getting your score. But that's it. Good luck, everybody, and I will see you at the end.
You're about to take a new and complete TOEFL listening practice test, but there are just a couple important things you should know before we start. The first thing you should know is that this test has been updated based on ETS's latest update, which is, was on July 26, 2023. Uh, and the listening really didn't change at all. The major changes came in the writing and the reading section. So the only real difference this time for the listening is on test day. You will not have an extended passage. If you don't know what that is, don't worry, it's gone. So you will have five passages on test day. Couple other things that I need to say that are differences between this YouTube video and the actual test. So the big thing is that on test day, when it's time to answer the questions, so you listen to a passage and then you answer one question at a time. On test day, you can take five seconds to answer a question. You can take 30 seconds to answer a question. It's really up to you and how quickly you find the answer. But for here, for this YouTube video, each question you're given the same amount of time. That's the only real big difference. Of course, also we have answers in the description. Make sure to look in the description for the answers. Please, can't say this enough. Also, there is a link to a PDF that explains all the answers. So it's very important for you to download that as well so you know why you got a question right and why you got a question wrong. If you wanna make sure to get your best possible score before test day, check out the TOEFL emergency course. It has study plans. If you need to study for two days, one week, two weeks, or one month, it's perfect for anybody who just needs one place for all your practice tests, all your tips and tricks and strategies. You don't have to waste any time and you'll know exactly what to do each day. Check that out, exclusive offer only for the YouTube audience. But that's it. Thank you guys for listening and good luck. Now listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Hi, professor. Do you mind if I talk to you for a minute? Sure, Carla. What's going on? Well, as you know, this has been a really difficult class for me, and I'm really, really nervous about the final coming up. I'm scared I'm going to fail this class, but I have to pass, or I'll have to take an extra class next semester, and I know that would be difficult. I was wondering if you could help me prepare or figure out a way to at least make sure I'll pass. Yes, I've noticed this class hasn't been easy for you. I'm glad you came to me because the last thing I want is for any of my students to fail the course. What have you been doing to prepare for the final? Well, I'm studying in the library whenever I can, but I feel like I just don't understand the information. I'm only taking this intro to biology class because I need to fulfill my science requirement. I'm a French major, and science just doesn't make sense to me. I'm really scared I'm not going to do well on the final. Is there any way I could do some extra credit to help my grade? I'm sorry, Carla, but there will be no opportunities for extra credit. If I let you do something, I would have to let everyone in the class do it. Oh, okay. Well, I understand, I guess. Why don't you see if you can study with some other students in the class? I'm sure Martin or Sarah would be willing to help you. They seem to have an excellent grasp on the material. I could. I kind of feel bad asking. I know Sarah is in the student government and Martin is on the soccer team, so I feel like they're both really busy. Well, if you don't feel comfortable working with them, you could always go to the student center and have them help you find a tutor. You would have to pay, but it's really cheap since they are student tutors and subsidized by the school. I guess I could do that. I really can't afford to fail this class, so I think I'm going to have to invest in a tutor. I know many students who have done well after working with one of the student tutors. If you decide to go that route, I'm sure you will benefit as well. I hope so. Thanks, Professor. Of course, Carla. Good luck. Now, answer the questions. 1. What problem is the student having?
2. Why does Carla mention that Sarah is in student government and Martin is on the soccer team? Three, why does the student say she is taking this class? Four, what does the professor suggest Carla do? Select two. Five, what is the professor implying when he says that Martin and Sarah have an excellent grasp on the material? Now listen to part of a talk in a biology class. All right, now a common misconception about global climate change, commonly referred to as global warming, is that if we experience an unusually hot day in this area alone, then it's evidence of climate change. I just want to take a second to make it clear that changes in local weather is a weather-related event, not a climate-related one. Climate refers to the long-term, predictable atmospheric conditions of a specific area, not the conditions of a day or even a week for that matter. Weather refers to the conditions of the atmosphere during a short period of time. Weather forecasts are usually made in 48-hour cycles and are more concerned with daily and hourly predictions. Yes, Henry? So you're saying that climate has more to do with seasonal changes? For example, like the difference between summer and winter in New York, while weather is more about the conditions outside today or tomorrow. That's right, Henry. So now that we have established exactly what we mean by climate, let me ask you about the causes of climate change. I mentioned them in the last class. Well, we started by talking about the Industrial Revolution, which began in the early 1800s, and that's when most of society started burning fossil fuels like oil and coal. And those fuels release a bunch of carbon dioxide into the air. And when there's more carbon dioxide in the air, more of the sun's energy gets trapped in the atmosphere. So the climate of the Earth warms. Perfect, Jessica. Maybe I should have you teach the class. So yes, most of us know about the harmful effects of the burning of fossil fuels and the release of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But what causes climate change? There are two more. Henry? I know one is solar intensity, and the other, I think, has something to do with volcanoes? Sorry, I can't remember exactly. Well, like you said, the intensity of the sun does change, believe it or not. Changes in the amount of heat from the sun has been proposed as one explanation for past climate events. And the third you're thinking of is volcanic eruptions. Ah, uh, that's right. I remember now. The gases released during an eruption can change the climate over a period of a few years. But this type of climate change is usually just short term, right? 
Right. Now, let's get back to fossil fuels. As Jessica mentioned, increased amounts of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are usually released through the burning of fossil fuels. Make no mistake, what may sometimes be reported in the media as debatable, there is no debate among scientists as to whether or not climate change is due to human activity. True, the strength of the sun's rays and the eruption of volcanoes can play a role, but there is an overwhelming amount of evidence that human activity, particularly the burning of fossil fuels, is to blame for the rise in global temperatures. And we are now starting to see the tremendous impact global warming is having on our environment. Between 2002 and 2006, Greenland lost almost 200 kilometers worth of glaciers. And as the glaciers melt around the globe, the sea levels rise, which threatens the coastal life of humans and the marine life of aquatic species. Now, many organisms on land are also being affected by the changes in climate. Temperature and rainfall play key roles in determining the geographic distribution of plants and animals. For example, researchers have shown that 385 plant species in England are flowering five days sooner than usual. In addition, insect species that pollinate and rely on these flowers are now arriving sooner than in previous decades. This mismatched timing of plants and insects could result in the loss of both species in the area. Small changes in the atmosphere have already made a big impact on species that rely on specific weather conditions. Most think of polar bears and their disappearing homeland of snow and ice. But this is just one of the many organisms threatened by global climate change. And that includes us humans. Now, answer the questions. 1. What is the professor mainly discussing? Two, the professor discusses several causes and effects of climate change. Indicate which information matches a cause or effect. This question is worth two points. Three, what is the difference between weather and climate? Select two. Four, according to the lecture, what is an example of the effects of climate change? Five, what is the professor implying when she says this? Perfect, Jessica. Maybe I should have you teach the class.
Six, what does the professor imply about the role of human activity in climate change? Now listen to part of a talk in an astronomy class. Okay, so I'm sure you all know what meteors are, right? Those bright shooting stars in the sky that sometimes pass through the atmosphere and land here on Earth as hot rocks? Well, these alien rocks go on quite a journey to make it here. You see, these meteors start off as comets from other areas in space. The ice in these comets melt when they get close to the sun, which breaks apart and sprays millions of tons of rock and dust into the solar system. As each of the larger dust and rock particles enters the Earth's atmosphere, it creates a brief, fiery trail that is often called a shooting star, but is properly known as a meteor. Since the particles move at speeds of many kilometers per second, Friction with the air vaporizes them at an altitude of between 80 and 130 kilometers. The resulting flash of light fade out within a few seconds. To be visible, these shooting stars, or meteors, must be within about 200 kilometers of the observer. On a typical dark and moonless night, you can see up to six meteors per hour, maybe more. Now, I don't know about you, but witnessing a shooting star is really a magical feeling. Anyway, the typical meteor is produced by a particle with the mass of less than one gram, no larger than a pea. How can we see such a small particle? The light you see comes from the much larger region of heated, glowing gas surrounding this little grain of material. Because of its high speed, the energy in a pea-sized meteor is greater than a bullet being fired by a gun on Earth. But as I'm sure you all know, these shooting stars, these meteors, sometimes land on the ground. Meteorites are pretty much found in two ways. First, our meteorite falls. Sometimes bright meteors or fireballs are observed to penetrate the atmosphere and find their way to the Earth's surface. The 2013 Chelyabinsk fireball in Russia produced tens of thousands of small meteorites, many of them easy to find because these dark stones fell on snow. People sometimes discover unusual-looking rocks that turn out to be meteoric. These rocks are termed meteorite finds, the second way meteors are found. Since the 1980s, meteorite finds in the Antarctic have dramatically increased our knowledge of space and its materials. More than 10,000 meteorites have been recovered from the Antarctic as a result of the motion of the ice in some parts of that continent. Meteorites that fall in regions where ice accumulates are buried and then carried slowly to other areas where the ice is gradually worn away. After thousands of years, the rock again finds itself on the surface, along with other meteorites carried to these same locations. The meteorites in our collections have a wide range of compositions and histories, but traditionally they have been placed into three broad classes. First are the irons, composed of nearly pure metallic nickel iron. The second are the stones, the term used for any rocky meteorite. The third are the rarer stony irons, made, as the name implies, of mixtures of stone and metallic iron. Of these three types, the irons and stony irons are the most obviously extraterrestrial because of their metallic content. Pure iron almost never occurs naturally on Earth. Therefore, if you ever come across a chunk of metallic iron, it is sure to be either man-made or a meteorite. The stones are much more common than the irons, but more difficult to recognize. Often, Laboratory analysis is required to demonstrate that a particular sample is really of extraterrestrial origin, especially if it has lain on the ground for some time and been subject to weathering. 
The most scientifically valuable stones are those collected immediately after they fall, or the Antarctic samples preserved in a nearly perfect state by the ice. Now, answer the questions. 1. What is the purpose of the lecture? Two, what does the professor say about shooting stars? Three, why does the professor discuss meteorites in the Antarctic? Four, what is the professor implying when he says this? Of these three types, the irons and stony irons are the most obviously extraterrestrial because of their metallic content. Five, based on the information from the listening, indicate which characteristic on the left belongs to either stones, irons, or stony irons. This question is worth two points. Six, why can we see a meteor falling in the sky if it is smaller than the size of a pea? Now listen to a conversation between a student and a career advisor. Hi, welcome to the Career Center. How may I help you? Hi, my name is Michael. I'm a senior and I'm trying to apply for some jobs. I don't want to have to worry about finding something over the summer after graduation. I saw a flyer the other day somewhere on campus that said you were offering resume reviews and that I could just drop in whenever to get some help with my resume. That's smart of you to get a head start. We do offer drop-in resume review, but that's only on Thursdays. And since today is Friday, of course you're going to have to come back next Thursday. Oh no, really? Darn, I was really hoping to get some help. There is one job in particular that I want to apply for, but the deadline is next Tuesday. So I need to get help with my resume before then. 
Well, what I could do is make you an appointment to meet with the career advisor. That will be better anyways, because then you can meet for an hour or so and discuss any questions you may have. That sounds amazing. When do you think I can get an appointment? Let me take a look at our calendar here. Ooh, I hate to say this, but it looks like all of our advisors are fully booked until Wednesday. No one is available until Wednesday? Yikes, that's too late also. I mean, I guess I could make an appointment anyway, since I'll be applying to other jobs in the future. But what should I do about this one? I have no idea how to write a good resume, and the job application is due Tuesday. Why don't I put you down on the wait list? So that way, if anyone cancels or something opens up, I will call you right away. In the meantime, you could try having a friend or family member help you out, or talk to someone you know who has written a resume before. That's probably your best bet. Yeah, I guess I'll have to do that. Well, thanks anyway, and please put me down for the appointment on Wednesday. Will do, and I will call you if anything opens up sooner. Have a great day. Now, answer the questions. 1. Why does the student go to the Career Center? 2. Why is the student upset that the resume review is only on Thursdays? 3. Why does the student take the appointment with a career advisor on Wednesday, even though it is after his application is due? 4. What will the student do since he is unable to get help from the Career Center before his job application is due? 5. How does the student feel after his conversation with the Career Center Receptionist? Now listen to part of a talk in an American history class. So America looked a lot different back in the early 19th century. Most Americans lived on the East Coast, populating cities like New York, Boston, and Philadelphia. However, there was still plenty of land west across the Mississippi and stretching all the way to the western shores of the Pacific Ocean in areas around present-day California. The American government wanted to get people to start moving out of the East Coast and migrating west to settle these lands and create new villages, towns, and settlements. 
The Homestead Act of the 19th century gave free land for any brave pioneers who were willing to migrate west and settle in the plains lands in modern-day states like Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. Now, of the hundreds of thousands of settlers who moved west, the vast majority were what we call homesteaders. These pioneers were mostly average families seeking land and opportunity. Free land sounded like a great deal to many recent immigrants who had difficulty finding work and had hardly any money to their name. The promise of a piece of land to raise a family and call home sounded too good to be true. And it was. You see, there was a reason why most of this land remained unclaimed. It was unsettled and hard to farm. Still, the idea of a new life was too good to miss for some. They settled throughout the land that now makes up the Midwestern states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, Kansas, Nebraska, and the Dakotas. The weather and environment was terrible, and settlers struggled to make out a living. The region typically had low rainfall, and harsh temperatures made the growing of crops almost impossible. Irrigation was a requirement, but finding water and building adequate systems proved too difficult and expensive for many farmers. The first houses built by Western settlers were typically made of mud and sod with thatched roofs, as there was little wood for building. Rain, when it arrived, presented constant problems for these sod houses, with mud falling into food and pests, most notably lice, living in the bedding. Weather patterns not only left the fields dry, they also brought tornadoes, droughts, blizzards, and a huge amount of insects. Farmers also faced the ever-present threat of debt and farm foreclosure by the banks. While land was essentially free under the Homestead Act, all other farm necessities cost money and were initially difficult to obtain in the newly settled parts of the country, where market economies did not yet fully reach. Horses, farm animals, wagons, wells, fencing, seed, and fertilizers were all critical to survival, but often hard to come by since so few people lived in these areas. Railroads charged high rates for farm equipment and farm animals, making it difficult to get goods or make a profit on anything sent back east. Banks also charged high interest rates, and in a cycle that repeated itself year after year, farmers would borrow from the bank with the intention of repaying their debt after the harvest. As the number of farmers moving westward increased, the market price of their produce declined, even as the value of the actual land increased. Each year, hard-working farmers produced ever larger crops, flooding the markets, and then driving prices down even further. Although some understood the economics of supply and demand, none could control such forces. Eventually, the arrival of a more extensive railroad network aided farmers, mostly by bringing much-needed supplies such as lumber for construction and new farm machinery. In turn, larger commercial farms began to develop. Farmers in Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota hired migrant farmers to grow wheat on large-scale farms. These enormous farms were succeeding by the end of the century, but small family farms continued to suffer. Although the land was nearly free, it cost close to $1,000 for the necessary supplies to start up a farm, an impossible sum for most. Many people who were drawn out west for free land ended up as hired workers, working on other farms for a daily wage. The frustration of small farmers grew, ultimately leading to a revolt. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's take a closer look at. Now, answer the questions. 1. What is the lecture mainly about? Two, what was the purpose of the Homestead Act?
Three. How does the professor organize the lecture? Four. Why does the professor talk about the farmers' homes? Five, why did many farmers end up needing a large amount of money to succeed in the new land? Six, what eventually led to the development of larger commercial farms? You're about to take a complete TOEFL speaking practice test and there's a few quick things you need to know before you start. The first thing is that you want to record your voice. If you don't record your voice, it's going to be very hard to grade your speaking. So you want to make sure that you try to grade your speaking so get ready to record your voice. Fun fun. The next thing you should know is that this is the latest update from TOEFL. They made an update on July 26, 2023. but the speaking really didn't change at all, so this is pretty much the same as it's been since 2019. After the questions finish, you will hear and see sample responses to each of the questions. So stick around to the end if you want to see a sample response for each. Also, you can download the 26 plus guide that will give you uh, tips and tricks and templates and strategies for each question type. And you can also download the PDF in the description that is the PDF version of this test. But that's about it. The last thing is that you should check out the TOEFL Emergency Premium course. If you have less than one month to prepare, this is perfect. We have study plans, two days, one week, two weeks, and one month. So no matter how much time you have in less than a month, everything you need is right there. So check out the TOEFL Emergency course. This is an offer only for the YouTube audience, but that's it. Thanks for listening. Good luck on your test and I will see you at the end. Directions. You will now be asked a question about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you will have 15 seconds to plan your response and 45 seconds to speak. Would you prefer to work at one job your entire life or to switch jobs every five years? Explain your response with details and examples. You have 15 seconds to prepare your response. You may begin preparing now. You now have 45 seconds to speak. You may begin speaking now.
directions. You will now read a short passage and then listen to a conversation about the same topic. You will then be asked a question about the passages. After you hear the question, you will have 30 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to speak. You have 45 seconds to read the passage below. You may begin reading now. Now listen to a conversation about the same topic. Hi, Peter. Did you hear they're going to make two graduation ceremonies this year? Yeah, they say it's due to enrollment numbers. Too many students getting their diplomas at once makes the ceremony last for hours. I really don't like that. What if some of my friends are assigned to a different ceremony than mine? We've been waiting for this day for years, and now what? Well, I mean, have you ever sat through the graduation ceremony? I went last year, and it lasted almost three hours. And it took almost an hour to just read the names. That's my point. Almost two hours of the ceremony consists of speeches. That's the real boring part. Why don't they limit the number of speakers? They could reduce the time of the ceremony over an hour if they just focused on the important people. Yeah, I guess you're right. But what about the auditorium? Each student is only allowed two invitations to the ceremony. But if they separate the events, then you can bring more of your family and friends. Don't you want more people to come? So why don't they just have the ceremony outside? Most universities have their graduation ceremonies outside. They are always in June when the weather is warm and it hardly ever rains. And of course, there's plenty of space on the great lawn and the quad. I don't know about you, but I would much rather graduate outside in the sun than in a stuffy auditorium. Now, answer the question. The woman expresses her opinion on the change to the graduation ceremony. State her opinion and explain the reason she gives for holding that opinion. You have 30 seconds to prepare your response. You may begin preparing now. You now have 60 seconds to speak. You may begin speaking now. Directions. You will now read a short passage and then listen to a lecture on the same topic. You will then be asked a question about the passages. After you hear the question, you will have 30 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to speak. You have 45 seconds to read the passage below. You may begin reading now.
Now listen to a lecture about this topic in a biology class. Okay, as I'm sure you gathered from the reading, swarm intelligence is kind of like one big decentralized brain. All of these individual brains come together to create one collective consciousness that everyone shares. These days, this type of intelligence is actually being used in the field of artificial intelligence, but it was originally found in nature and many insects use it to create organized living systems. Take ants, for example. They will work together to find the shortest route to a food source and work together to carry it back to the nest. Now, how do they communicate? Well, the individual ants mark their route with their scent, also known as a pheromone. This scent, left by one individual ant, will be sensed and followed by other members of the colony. And the more ants that follow the same trail, the more pheromones they leave behind. The path turns into a kind of ant superhighway. Other possible routes no longer seem available to the colony since there is no pheromone trail for others to follow. A ants aren't the only insects that use swarm intelligence. Honeybees also utilize collective communication to organize masses of individuals. During adverse weather conditions, a thunderstorm for example, bees may lose their nest and must find a new home. However, it takes time to find an ideal location and build their new home. So. The queen bee will find a branch on a tree and send out pheromones that the worker bees follow. Once they find their queen, the worker bees will collect and press together, forming a kind of giant pine cone that could include up to 10,000 bees, if you can believe it. Now, there would be no way for a single bee to survive such weather if it was working by itself. Now, answer the question. Using the examples from the lecture, Explain the concept of swarm intelligence. You have 30 seconds to prepare your response. You may begin preparing now. You now have 60 seconds to speak. You may begin speaking now. Directions. You will now listen to part of a lecture. You will then be asked a question about it. After you hear the question, you will have 20 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to speak. Now listen to part of a lecture in an archaeology class. Preservation of archaeological artifacts for future generations is an important task. Although the deterioration of objects and materials is inevitable, Proper preservation can make the process much slower. Creating the ideal conditions in museums is extremely important because historical artifacts can be affected by various environmental factors. The most important are temperature and relative humidity. Maintaining a stable temperature in museums and storage centers is critical. The same temperature should be maintained every day, all day, and all night. Actually, a sudden change in temperature is more dangerous than having no climate control at all. 
Objects made from organic materials like paper, wood, or leather may wither and dry out if exposed to a sudden temperature fluctuation. Most museums maintain a temperature of between 68 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit, and it takes every possible step to ensure there is little to no variation. If, for example, a city loses power, many museums have backup power sources to ensure that their interior temperature remains constant. Relative humidity, which is the amount of moisture in the air, could also have a negative effect on ancient artifacts. In metal objects, a high level of relative humidity could cause the object to corrode or develop mold. In contrast, low humidity could cause paper or leather to turn more brittle and fragile. Ideally, there should be a different level of humidity for different collections, depending on the material of the artifacts in question. Still, most museums set their humidity levels somewhere between 45 to 50 percent. Throughout most modern museums, sensors have been installed that monitor the amount of humidity in the air. Once the level of humidity changes by over 2%, the system takes action and adjusts its settings. Now, answer the question. Using points and examples from the talk, describe how museums preserve artifacts. You have 20 seconds to prepare your response. You may begin preparing now. You now have 60 seconds to speak. You may begin speaking now. To me, I definitely think that it is better to switch jobs every five years because old jobs get boring and new places are exciting. I remember when I worked at a school in New York, and at first, everything was new and interesting, but by the fifth year, I was tired of taking the same train to go to the same building every day. On top of that, starting a new job is a new opportunity. For example, after my job in New York, I moved to Japan and started teaching English to children which was completely different. It motivated me to learn and expand my knowledge. So, to sum up, if I had to choose, I would definitely opt for changing my job every five years. The reading passage announces a change on campus. In particular, the administration has decided to split the graduation ceremony into two separate events. Right off the bat, the woman makes it clear that she is against this idea. To start, she says that she wants to graduate with her friends. And if the ceremony is split, then they can't graduate together. She does admit that the graduation ceremony is too long right now, but it could be shortened by reducing the number of speakers. Secondly, she explains that the graduation event should be held outside rather than in the auditorium if the committee is concerned about space. Most other schools hold their graduation events outside, and there would be plenty of space for additional guests. As you can see, the woman in the listening clearly disagrees with this plan. According to the reading, 
Swarm intelligence is when a bunch of different insects of the same species are able to combine and connect their thoughts so hundreds of individuals can think and act as one. In the lecture, the professor delves deeper into this subject by explaining that ants use this type of thinking when gathering food. One group of ants will find a way to the food source and release pheromones to mark the trail. Other ants will then follow the pheromone scent. He goes on to say that honeybees use this type of intelligence when looking for a new place to live. In fact, a queen bee might send out a pheromone that attracts thousands of other bees that come together and form a kind of temporary home where the bees can survive. So, after listening, I now have a better understanding of what swarm intelligence is. The professor goes into a ton of detail about the preservation of artifacts in museums, which helps slow down the deterioration process of these ancient objects. After introducing the topic, the lecturer mentions that a stable temperature is key. Materials like paper and wood dry out easily if the temperature changes too drastically, which is why most museums keep the temperature between 68 to 72 degrees. Many museums even have backup power sources just in case they lose electricity so they can maintain the temperature. The professor goes on to say that the moisture in the air, otherwise known as relative humidity, must be carefully controlled. For metal objects, higher humidity levels could lead to corrosion. On the other hand, low humidity can make objects like paper more fragile. Most places housing artifacts keep the relative humidity between 45 to 50 percent. So, after hearing this lecture, I now have a better understanding of how museums preserve their artifacts. You're about to take a complete TOEFL writing practice test, and this is the new version with some big changes. So on July 26, 2023, the TOEFL updated a little bit. They changed a couple things, and the big change is in the TOEFL writing section where there's still two tasks, there's still two writing responses you have. Question one is the same, it's called the integrated task, but the second question changed. It used to be the independent writing, doesn't exist anymore. Now it's writing for an academic discussion. It looks like this. Follow the directions during the test, and if you need more help and more guidance with this question, you can look at a video that I'll put a link in the description below to a guide to this writing for an academic discussion question. But let's get ready to write. So be sure to have a app open that you can type in without spell check, because remember on test day, there's no spell check. There is a TOEFL Writing 24 Plus guide that you can download that includes templates, tricks, and strategies, and I'll put a link in the description below. One more link you'll see is a complete test, this complete test, and you can see example essays there as well. Also, check out the TOEFL Emergency Premium course. We have study plans. If you have two days, one week, two weeks, one month, everything you need in one place, you'll know exactly what to do every day so you don't have to jump around to YouTube videos and worry about what to practice. You'll know exactly what to practice. You'll learn the most important tips and tricks in the least amount of time, so check that out. The fastest and, easy way, fastest and easiest way to get your TOEFL score is the TOEFL Emergency Course at TST Prep. So that's it. Thank you guys for watching. Good luck, and I will see you at the end. Writing Task 1. Directions. For this task, you will read a passage and listen to a lecture about an academic topic. You may take notes during this time. After the passages have finished, you will then be asked a question about them. After the question, you have 20 minutes to write your response. Effective responses are usually between 200 to 350 words. You may look at the reading passage and your notes as you write. Keep in mind that the question will not ask for your opinion. You have three minutes to read. You may begin reading now.
Now listen to part of a lecture on the same topic you just read about. There's no doubt that turtle excluder devices are a great idea that must be used by every single shrimping boat. However, they are far from perfect and in need of drastic improvement, regardless of what the author in the reading may believe. First of all, TEDs are metal barriers that, in theory, don't allow anything more than 10 centimeters to pass through them. However, many small and mid-sized turtles are still constantly caught deep in the nets of trawls. Species like the leatherback and loggerhead turtles are smaller and unable to use the metal barriers to their advantage. It's also important to keep in mind that TEDs don't only exclude turtles, but there are instances where some lucky shrimp hit the metal barrier and escaped the trawl. In order to reduce shrimp loss, and more importantly, their profits, many boat owners prefer not to use the device at all. When it comes time to drop the trawl in the open sea, shrimpers will simply remove the TED, and it's almost impossible for any organization to monitor these ships so far from shore. And, finally, it should be noted that many vessels that claim to be certified TED trawl users and have documents that claim that they comply with the rules of the shrimp turtle law actually have fake documents. You see, shrimping is an international business, and the documentation to be considered TED certified changes based on the country of the boat in question. With so much difference between countries, few people know when a vessel is holding a fake certification or a real one. Now, answer the question. Summarize the points made in the lecture, being sure to explain how they cast doubt on the specific points made in the reading passage. You have 20 minutes to write.
Congratulations, you made it to the end. Writing in English is really hard. Be proud of yourself. Remember, if you need more help, check out tstprep.com. We have teachers, we have courses, we have classes, we have more free practice, so check that out. And also you can check out this video here to give you some more help with the TOEFL writing. But that's it, thanks for watching and I'll see you next one.